Good morning. It's my pleasure to come to you today to tell you about two of my favorite subjects, that being human health and innate immunity, and how they're impacted in people exposed to the interior environments of water-damaged buildings. I'm from a little town in Pocomoke, Maryland, and I'm a treating physician. I've seen over 5,000 people with this kind of illness since 1998. This ability to treat the illness has given me a perspective perhaps a little different from others, in that inflammatory changes are ones that we can show coming and going uh, in these patients. And indeed, we can present the results of a prospective clinical trial to show what changes appear sequentially. We can then ch compare those sequential changes of innate immune elements with a building index, the environmental relative mold index, to come up with a landscape approach to illness seen in people in water damaged buildings. From my perspective, it would be ideal if industrial hygienists and physicians work together closely in looking at health issues associated with water damaged building exposure. Unfortunately, I just don't see that very often. Often there is a concern regarding blame for human health problems and water damaged building exposure. And unfortunately, that means there's often a lawyer lurking in the background somewhere whose presence does affect what people think and say. In the ideal world, it would be wonderful if correcting problems and restoring human health were more important than blame. Having said that, I want you to know that clinical trials have clearly shown that we can assign objective parameters using readily obtained laboratory tests that show the differences between cases and controls, and moreover, show the differences in people when they're exposed and when they're re-exposed to water-damaged buildings. This prospective acquisition of data with re-exposure is critical to the concept of causation. The exciting findings for today and the future is that we now can correlate these objective health parameters with readily obtained objective parameters of building health using an index that employs DNA found in fungi in settled dust. In 2003, our group published a case definition that was peer-reviewed on two separate occasions for the human illness acquired following exposure to water-damaged buildings. We used two tiers in this case definition. The first tier is modeled uh, on the case definition that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention used in the Fisteria cases, uh, and that was the possible estuarine-associated syndrome back in the late 90s. Uh, in this aspect, there must be the potential for exposure, there must be the presence of a multi-system, multi-symptom illness, and there must be absence of confounders. We then have added a second tier to this case definition in which there must be three of six elements present using a fairly standard protocol in medicine to help define a syndrome. Specifically, the reason we selected these six second tier items is that basically we look at what did patients have with when they were sick compared to what controls had who weren't sick. We arbitrarily assigned a specificity and sensitivity of 100% in the case definition, understanding that biology is never 100%. As an aside today, when I use the term mold illness, uh, that's part of my jargon. It's, uh, it's, it's simply a short shorthand that I use. Uh, what I want to go over is that this mold illness is one that is a complex, acute and chronic systemic inflammatory response acquired following exposure to the interior environment of a water damaged building with resident toxigenic elements including, but not limited to, fungi, mycobacteria, bacteria, actinomycetes, and inflammagens including beta-glucans, 
VOCs, proteinases, hemolysins, possibly spirocyclic drymanes, and who knows what more we're going to find in the future. Obviously, that's, that definition for what mold illnesses is is a mouthful. What's in the building, as far as we can say with certainty, is that there is a mixture or a chemical stew, if, if, if you will. Uh, it's thinking about the first tier of this case definition for a minute. When I say absence of confounders, what that really means is the physician must do a differential diagnosis. Uh, that process takes uh, a great deal of time, uh, specifically because patients with uh, this syndrome uh, have between 18 and 20 symptoms on average per person. The differential diagnosis then for many symptoms like this becomes a sequential process. It's not just performed at the first visit, it is ongoing. The second tier of our case definition helps us because we look at the fundamental mechanism of this disease. In, there are problems in genetics. There is a very clear genetic association in people with illness with particular immune response genes uh, called HLA-DR when measured by uh, a special PCR technology. Specifically, there are 24% of the population that we see represented by these immune response genes, uh, and primarily that's what we find in cases. Uh, what that means is that 76% of the population will not have these so-called susceptible genes, uh, and that means that control populations are dominated uh, in this situation when there's exposure. Uh, let's look again at another element of the second tier that is visual contrast sensitivity. This is a test that's used in neurotoxicology for about 50 years. It measures the neurologic function of the ability to detect the difference between uh, gray uh, sinusoidal wave patterns as presented stimulus to a gray background. We also know as a, an additional element of the case definition that there's a clear involvement of innate immunity with very low levels of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, that's MSH, and high levels of matrix metalloproteinase 9, that's MMP9, and each of which uh, are abnormal in a significant percentage of patients with this illness. MMP9 is one of the best indicators of cytokine production uh, endogenously. There are two other elements that we use because of their high percentage found in cases compared to controls, and each one represents dysregulation of normal hormone physiology, ACTH and cortisol, and then antidiuretic hormone, that's also known as vasopressin, related to osmolality. What we... Uh, need to remember here is that when I'm speaking about innate immunity, I need you to know that is not acquired immunity. Acquired immunity primarily has to do with uh, antibody formation. Uh, innate immunity uh, looks at the primordial system of defenses we find intact in just about any organism that's been on the face of the earth. These were the first mechanisms to the, used by organisms to recognize foreign invaders. The recognition of foreign antigens is accomplished by pattern receptors, particular kinds of molecules that set off an alarm system that then tells the nucleus to turn on production of particular genes to release inflammatory compounds, including cytokines, that then set off other inflammatory events. This sequential activation of a pattern receptor is accomplished by relatively few molecules such that each step of the inflammatory cascade that follows is exponential. And that means that if a small stimulus is not controlled, there can follow a gigantic multiplying innate immune response. This innate immune response, fortunately, is easily measured in blood tests. Uh, I don't want to give you a whole lot of jargon today. <coughs> <coughs>